Okay, I think we are live. Uh, yeah, I've got live in the top left corner. Great, excellent. Uh, apologies for the delay, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome to plenary session part three. Right off the bat. Oh, sorry, I've got an echo of myself. Right off the bat, uh, apologies. We are we are currently waiting for uh, one of our one of our speakers to join us, and it's quite fitting that he's having difficulties with the technology connect, uh, uh, connecting to the webcast, which I think uh, speaks to the theme of the next session, which is getting back to business, but not as usual. Now, all over the world, people are, are keen to get back to business, get back to work. But uh, you know, 2020 being what it has been so far, um, that is a process right now that has a lot more questions than answers attached to it. And what we want to do with this session, and we've got two great perspectives. Uh, we will have two great perspectives. I'm joined by James Warrior, who is the CEO and Managing Director of Centum Investments. He will be joining us. Uh, Centum is East Africa's biggest investment firm. And um, it's a great opportunity to hear from uh, someone you know, actively doing business in Africa, how the pandemic has affected uh, operating and how it is going to change the nature of operating going forward. And then on screen with me, uh, we have Trond Rieber Knutsen, who is the founder and CEO of TRK Group, a very active investor across Africa with a very heavy focus on the technology sector. So there we have the, the other side of this, which is the international investor perspective looking at Africa. So we, we really get both sides of the equation here. What does it look like if you're on the ground right now? And what does it look like if you are you know uh, outside the continent uh, looking in? In terms of progression, I think we, we do two things. We, we start with a stock take. And, um, you know, Trond, I'll come to you in a minute. Uh, I, I want to get a sense from you, apart from the obvious disruption that we all know, we're all familiar with, with the disruption that's taken place this year. What are some of the, you know, what are some of the, 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 the key changes in operating that you've had to deal with this year uh, that you know that that have just kind of impacted your ability to get things done. And uh, in the pre-panel briefing, we you mentioned that you you actually sent out a survey to some of your investee companies across Africa to get some feedback from them. So I think that would be really great insight as well. And then once we've done that, we can move into some of the bigger questions like what is the what are the next steps? Where do we go? And what does that world look like? Anyway, to start with, uh, Tron, over to you. Um, how's the year been? How's business been? How much, how much harder has it been to just get things done? Yeah. Thank you, Landre. Um, and um, I'm very happy to, to be here uh, to discuss uh, this with, uh, with you and with the broader audience. Um, so um, uh, just to start off with, uh, as you said, uh, we are uh, very active on the continent. Uh, we are uh, uh, involved uh, in technology, but uh, broadly across many different sectors, from uh, agriculture, waste management, data information services, media, banking, healthcare, education, so across 13 countries in sub Saharan Africa. So uh, um, across this portfolio, uh, kind of the biggest change, of course, has been that I haven't been, I have not been on the continent since February. Uh, that's that's uh, a huge impediment uh, to being able to uh, really add value. Uh, and as an investor, and you know this, uh, we really would like to be present and support the teams. Um, and that's been hard. Um, and we have another thing we have seen is that we are active also in Europe. So we are active in Europe and we are active in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's been much tougher in Sub-Saharan Africa than in Europe. And, and partly the uh, tech infrastructure is typically not as available in Africa. And particularly with remote teams where people have to sit at home Clearly, you're at a disadvantage in many countries in Africa versus, you know, being uh, in Sweden. Uh, so we see that kind of uh, polarization in a way, uh, in an unfairly way, uh, increasing. And then I would say, you know, uh, the level of support that we get from governments in the EU and in Norway is amazing through COVID. There are support all 
over the place. But in Africa, yeah. we don't get anything, anything. So, you know, this polarization is just increasing and it's making it harder uh, in a very unfair way. And that makes uh, many of us uh, just sad and, uh, and, and um, uh, partly discouraged. Look, uh, you, you've, I think for me, you've raised some of the most fundamental issues here. Um, the, the digital divide, I think, is key, um, and I want to get back to that. But the, the point, and, you know, it's a sort of, it's, it's almost anecdotal. You made the point, I haven't been on the continent since February. Now, everyone will agree that, you know, getting, being on the ground, getting on a plane and actually going is key. You know, if, if, whenever you ask people for advice, how do you do Africa? It's one of the most important pieces of advice you have to go. You can't do Africa long distance. Um, and many would argue that it's even more important in Sub-Saharan Africa, given the given where it is in its development trajectory than in other parts of the world. Now, um, how it, it, many people are like, it's fine, we can go online, we can do Zoom, we can do this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's more of a problem in Africa, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, the feedback I get from uh, from all of our teams is that uh, presence uh, is, if anything, more important in, in Africa uh, than what you see in Europe and perhaps North America. Uh, the relationship building, uh, trust building that takes place uh, through the kind of physical presence uh, is so important. Uh, so a um, good thing uh, for us has been that more or less all of our teams uh, are uh, local uh, and uh, they've been on the ground. Uh, we only had one situation where the founder for a few months um, uh, went back to Europe. Uh, but except for that, we have had people on the ground uh, in all of these different uh, companies. And that's been super important. Here I can see James. Has As you can see, James has joined us. James, great to have Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, My apologies for... No worries. Bit, yeah. No worries. We're all adapting, right? That's what yeah. 2020 is all about. That's what this session is all about. So we'll That's just true. say, it, we'll say it was part of the plan. Um, yeah. uh, we, so we've, we've just um, been getting a bit of a sense from Trump of how uh, business has been affected from an in international investor standpoint uh, in, in Africa. And he's, you know, he's, he's touched on some really, really key issues one of which being that uh, just not being able to travel is is really making life hard. And uh, those, you know, anyone familiar with doing business on the continent will know that being physically present is vital um, and not being able to do that is going to be a, a problem for, for any business. Now, what I want to do um, is is come over to you, James, and get 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 more of that on the ground perspective because Centum is is East Africa's biggest investment firm. Um, you know, you're uh, born and raised in Kenya, but you're now a, a regional regional outfit. Uh, it would be great to get at the outset a sense from you of what have what's been the most tangible impact on just day to day operations for you uh, as a result of this pandemic. And then what we're what we're going to do as a group is then ask the question. Okay, so going forward now. As a business, how do you adapt? What what is coming your way, or what can we anticipate to the extent that we can is coming our way? Over to yeah. you, James. Yeah, thank you very much, Landry, and once again, my apologies and uh, pleasure to meet you, Trond, as well. It's great to be here. The we have a diversified portfolio, so we've been able to have a first-hand feel of um, what's happening across across the ground, across sort of the entire spectrum of the of the various sectors. Uh, I would say when the pandemic broke out in March the governments here imposed a range of restrictions. And those restrictions ranged from a curfew, reduction in uh, trading hours, uh, restrictions of movements, etc. The impact they had in business was, um, was varied. Some sectors were very much affected in terms of um, consumer demand dried up completely for sectors, for example, that provide international travel, catering to international uh, travel, uh, education, schools are, some schools are closed and they remain closed. In a number, they're just reopening now. So sectors that are directly in that particular um, area were, were affected. Uh, hospitality was also affected. Some sectors were not as affected. So we have a range of sort of manufacturing was not as affected. So that's on the demand, on the demand side. So there's been an impact on the demand side. I would say that uh, as the measures have been easing and as the impact of the disease has been better understood, some of those measures have eased across East Africa. 
uh, you cannot travel uh, and 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 so we are seeing demand coming coming back but it's coming back at different paces depending on the on the industry uh, the other area of, um, of, of of impact is on route to market for a number of uh, of companies whereby you are a manufacturing business you need to access the market and the the intermediate retailers were also were also affected again as the as the restrictions have been eased we are seeing an improvement in that obviously that then led to a liquidity crunch and for us we also exposed in the banking sector and so we've seen a range of uh, restructurings taking place across the entire industry in kenya for example the central bank of kenya um, uh, allowed banks to restructure uh, loans to, to to lenders which were performing as of the beginning of the period as of march and we've seen a very significant uh, restructuring uh, taking taking place of course the other impact has been on uh, on staff and ability of staff to be in the office and a majority of staff now in a lot of businesses we have arrangements and protocols where staff work from home so that we can restrict uh, sort of uh, congestion in so so it's been it's been, it's been a very varied impact and it's been a very dynamic situation but i'd like to say that uh, what you're seeing is an, an improvement I, I two two quick follow ups to that one uh, how much of a burden have you found the the inability to travel uh, on a you know from a personal standpoint have you felt that it's just made it harder to to literally just get the basics of, of running a business done so for us it's a bit different because for each of our portfolio companies we have a dedicated management team that is always on the ground so for example we are, we have not been able to travel to Uganda as an example but where that is inconveniencing we have an md we have a board we have an entire management team that is in Uganda. So, so that has been, yes, a restriction. But because of the way the business is organized, where it's highly localized, uh, we've been able to mitigate that, uh, you know, that impact. So they're able to make their decisions and you can then uh, engage on, um, on a digital platform. How, how have you found uh, government support for, for business? Has it been sufficient <clears throat> in Kenya? You know, you know, government support can never really be sufficient to mitigate the impact of a pandemic such as this, no matter what they try. So there have been a range of measures which have been uh, uh, helpful. Uh, for example, VAT was reduced from 15% to 14%. Uh, corporation tax and personal taxes were reduced from 30% to 25%. Uh, banks have flexibility around mm -hmm. their restructuring. So there have been a number of measures which have been, uh, which have been helpful in a sense, but I don't think they can totally put you in the position you are uh, pre pre covid the idea was to try and preserve the position of the companies to the extent that the fiscal positions of the governments could allow so to to read between the lines you're not you're not waiting for the government to to come and come to the rescue here which is a bit different from what we've seen in 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 other parts of the world like europe where governments have effectively stepped in to to run the economy and it's a point trump made that uh, for many african governments it's simply not viable to roll out the kinds of stimulus packages that we've seen. So uh, the slight difference in approach in that you can't sit around and wait for the government to come and, and, and sort it out. Uh, Trunt, I'd like to come back to you. You, you did a, you know, you sent out questions to some of your, uh, some of your teams across, you know, across Africa. You mentioned earlier that you're in a, a very diverse range of sectors and uh, James underlined the point that depending on what sector you're in right now, uh, you're going to be differently affected. Uh, can you give us a sense of what are the teams on the ground saying? Um, and and also, uh, which sectors right now on the chopping block? And and conversely, are there also sectors that are actually going to benefit from this? Yeah? Yeah. Um, so, um, interestingly, in, in kind of the feedback, I would say, um, number one, it's very clear that, uh, and I think as James said, this is very dependent on sector. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in James' uh, home country, I think in Kenya, uh, we have seen uh, our e-commerce player, Sky Garden, uh, saw demand increase with 120% immediately after uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown, which is exactly the same number, by the way, as our e-grocery player in Norway, Kulnial, so their <laughs> growth increase in the weeks after uh, over lockdown. Uh, so you have, you have that on one side. Uh, and then on the other side in Kenya, uh, we also have Hotel Online, which is the you know reservation data platform for a large number of hotels in the hospitality sector. 
uh, and no surprise, uh, pretty much all revenue disappeared in a week or two. Um, a couple of things that have been happening, uh, which I think is uh, interesting, and I can take the hotel online uh, as an example, that team has been incredibly agile in changing their value proposition and how they actually help players in the hospitality sector. So they've been helping hotels leverage their restaurants for meal delivery, which has been you know, a very interesting opportunity during the pandemic. They have done all types of say, uh, software sales and so forth. So there's a second observation has been that we have seen more agility and willingness to radically change uh, with many of our teams in Africa versus what we see in Europe, where the, it's a bit more static and you expect to be supported. So that, I think that's quite, and it's not surprising to me. Uh, I think the level of entrepreneurship, uh, closeness to market, willingness to innovate, and uh, not being arrogant uh, is a strength with the uh, African entrepreneurs that we, we work with. And then kind of finally to that point, um, it's interesting even within sectors that there probably been a significant change and migration in demand pattern uh, during the pandemic, uh, which typically is a migration to lower cost. Uh, uh, most consumers uh, have less spending power. Um, and um, that's, for example, helped uh, Opera, Opera uh, software with their browser, Opera News and so forth that uh, delivers uh, very uh, you know, efficient ways to consume data through their compression algorithms. Um, so you actually, you know, you get more data for your money by using Opera's uh, products. And in this type of situation, that's seen a significant increase in, uh, in demand. Um, and, we, and you know, we see that across sectors. So, so one thing is just by sector, but even more importantly, within sectors, you need to be correctly positioned and you need to be agile. Um, and we've seen uh, quite a lot of that with our teams in, in Africa. It's a, it's a very promising sign. Great, thank you. Thank you, Trond. Uh, James, did you have any thoughts on that? Otherwise, um, I'll, uh, we'll move on. Yeah, yeah, we can move on. I think Trond okay, great. captured it very well. Yeah, like I, I think the, an important takeaway from that is, uh, and it's to be determined at, at this point, but does this change the investment profile for mm -hmm. Africa, i.e. which sectors are going to be more or less attractive going forward? So, you know, pre-pandemic, pre uh, tourism and hospitality, very hot, uh, very attractive. Um, to what extent is that going to slow down and how might that hurt, you know, the, the, the general investor uh, approach to Africa? I think that's something to, to keep an eye on. Um, now, moving on to... To the the next big question, I think re really is okay. So what happens next uh, in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term? What is obvious is that we're not going back to where we were in February, March, two thousand and twenty. What what we are going back to at this point is anyone's guess, right? There is tremendous amount of confusion, a tremendous amount of back and forth. Uh, it's not even clear who is who is going to decide, right? How much a government's going to do? How much is business going to have to do? The problem, of course, if you are in business, is you can't afford to sit around and wait for a convenient answer to you know, to reveal itself. So in the interim, what would be great to to uh, hear from both of you is what are your what do your plans look like? Like to the extent that you can plan, what do you anticipate will be some of the medium to long term adaptations that you're going to have to make uh, from an operating standpoint? James, first from you, it'd be great to get some thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for us, okay, you know, for starters, for, for, for many of us, we already have portfolio companies, so you're already invested. It's not like you have a sack of money looking for new investments. So you're trying to see with the existing companies, how do you pivot to the extent that they have been affected so that you get back to pre-COVID and, and, and you continue your growth trajectory from there. Now, the impact of COVID has been one on, on demand and, and ability of customers to, to afford. I think until um, this COVID situation mm -hmm. is it and you get economic activity where it was, that will probably remain a problem. Uh, and so one then has to look at their cost structure and see how do you then uh, operate and remain in business 
with a lower level of business activity to the extent that has happened. And for a lot of our, of our businesses where we've needed to make those structural shifts from in terms of changing your fixed cost structure, reducing it, having a more variable cost structure, uh, changing away the way you do a lot of things, th those have already happened because you have to you have to survive in the short term for you to have a strategy in the in the long term. Then there are businesses for which now there is a different set of opportunity. You know, we did not know that our children could learn online, for example, uh, online streaming of books. Again, there is conversations around the investment necessary to to tap the market that is emerging because of the change in the way consumers consume the the product. And, and, and again, that is very uh, company company specific. So, but the, the thing that this has also created is a lot of uncertainty. And when there's uncertainty, then investors are risk averse. You're looking at making shorter term investment decisions, shorter term lending uh, decisions, shorter payback uh, periods. So I think as long as you have this uncertainty, investors will probably take shorter term, sort of a shorter view in terms of their, their investment horizon. Uh, until we sort of see where we end up, uh, where we end up, where we end up landing. Look, it's a it's a really important point, and I think it's worth underlining that that uh, how, this is going to affect the way the investor sentiment and the willingness to put money down, right? And I think the the point around sh short term thinking is really significant to Africa because one of the biggest challenges is finding patient capital, right? Long term investors, long-term investments, and people who have take a long-term view like, like Trump on, on the opportunity. Uh, Trump, do you want to uh, respond to that? How do you see, where do you see some of the big changes coming your way? Yeah, um, so um, uh, uh, there's one conundrum I just wanted to uh, perhaps address, uh, which is that um, during COVID um, in Europe, uh, investors have uh, been very willing to move capital uh, into uh, technology and even into earlier stage uh, companies. Uh, I think they've seen this being a catalyst, they've seen changes, they started using Zoom and Teams and so forth, uh, and they started to see a negative effect on uh, the old stranded assets within uh, old industries, including real estate and shipping and oil and gas and so forth. Very important shift going on that is fueling the growth in the tech sectors uh, in uh, North America and in, in Europe. Um, here, Africa is left behind at the moment. And um, um, what I'm trying to do, so part of my, my, my work is to uh, try to bridge that opportunity, try to reduce the perceived risk of investing into tech in Africa. Uh, I think the same thing has happened in Africa, that this, this has been catalytic. Uh, many tech companies are well positioned. Um, so part of what I'm doing is, you know, uh, been establishing uh, the Lardal Million Lives Fund uh, with the Lardal Medical kind of family, a uh, hundred million dollar fund uh, to uh, support tech companies uh, that will help save lives. Our ambition is to be part of saving a million lives every year, uh, which I think is very important. Um, we just established the Antler Talent Incubator in Nairobi uh, with the $30 million fund, primarily coming from families here in Norway, friends of mine. Um, so I'm trying to, uh, my primary, uh, in a way, I think contribution laundry in this is to be part of a credible bridge between the continent uh, and particularly the tech sector on the continent and the capital, particularly in, in Europe. Um, and, uh, and that will be very important going forward. I'm certain opportunities are, are significant and uh, all the feedback I get is that that's the case. But the cost of capital is still high in, in Africa. Uh, while it's coming down significantly for technology in uh, in Europe. So in that competitive game between where will the tech investments go, uh, again, this is again an area where you see this unfair polarization going on, where actually, you know, what should have gone to Africa is now go going into tech in, in, in the Nordics and in Europe. Yeah, it's a it's a really important observation. Um, the digital divide it uh, it's it's something that you hear a lot about. Um, I think people underestimate how significant it is. Um, if you if you want more information on that, I suggest reading 
the, the first ever State of the Digital Economy report was published by the UN last year. And uh, basically what it says is if you have if you have the best infrastructure, you're going to win in the digital economy. And if you have the worst, you're going to lose. And uh, unfortunately, Africa at the moment is on the losing side. But, you know, that's a that's a bigger topic than we can address here. Um, I'd like to draw on a comment from the uh, from the chat, actually. And it's directly it's directed at you, James. But I think it's also relevant to you, Tron. Is it, it's a question about a sentence portfolio and specifically uh, around real estate allocation. So uh, the, the figure that's quoted is that the aim is to achieve 45 to 55% allocation in real estate. Uh, is that, are you planning to maintain that? And I think the interesting part of that question is, are some of your, are you, you know, are some of your investments up for review? Like, are you looking at maybe leaving some uh, sectors? Are you, might, can you see yourself maybe being forced to have to wind down certain types of investments? Is there, is there a question to be asked around, hey, do we need to, re-examine exactly what we invest in yeah 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 thank you thank you for that question so if you look at uh, at, at real estate it has um, it has a lot of sub asset classes within real estate so our primary focus is on the residential segment of, of real estate and even with covid even with what's going to happen people still need places to stay and and i don't think you can substitute that with anything else and, and the model we pursue which we which we sort of came across by trial and error is a, is a customer-led model. So we normally, pre we, we only build what we have sold. So today of the 1,400 odd units that are under construction, we've sold about 75% of them. So you're delivering what the customer wants by establishing you have the right product and, 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 and sort of it's at the right, it's at the right price. So the idea on our end is not to allocate more new capital into that sector. It's, it's largely a customer funded, largely customer funded business, uh, business model. It is as you sort of realize profits from that sector, you then reallocate them to other segments of the, of the, of the, of the economy. So that's, that's what you're doing on, um, on the real estate space. In fact, tomorrow we'll be launching a project in Vipingo, which is an industrial park and, uh, and a residential scheme. And the residential scheme is about 400, about 500 units. And the interesting thing is that probably less than 20 are not sold at the moment. And, and this is even in this COVID environment. So in some areas of real estate, you're still seeing uh, demand, especially if we're able to deliver it at, uh, at, at what the consumer feels to be a good value. But you're not finding that your overall portfolio is having to be changed because of the pandemic? You see, portfolios are not easy to change. Uh, you can't change a portfolio in six in six months. You know, or you review have, perhaps in terms of yeah, strategy. Yeah. So what you're able to review is where you allocate new capital. So where you've had existing exits is sort of where you want to allocate your focus. And I would like to agree with Tron that right now our focus in terms of new deployment is largely in, on the private side, and also looking at technology opportunities, etc. That's sort of the area of focus because what you have you have no choice but to focus on optimizing its value so that even when you want to achieve an exit you can get you can get the best exit uh, you know possible in the in, in the future excellent uh tron did you have any thoughts on that on that point before we uh before we move on um no i think uh, uh, as you can uh, hear uh, we are quite uh, optimistic uh, on the tech uh, sector um, across the continent. Um, and as uh, James was talking, I was re reflecting on one advantage often is that you don't rely on full integration into the incumbent value chains with a lot of, kind of wasted interest and inefficiencies. And um, restructuring these old value chains uh, is a massive undertaking. Um, and if you can uh, shortcut, uh, or you can establish a new um, value chain, a new route to market. Um, it's uh, often better, I think. Uh, really being disruptive, as opposed to uh, to do all the transformative work. So we we are, I think we have seen some of that uh, development. And if there's one other thing, um, I would say that um, I think we're starting to see a clear, clear difference between countries in the continent in terms of uh, being attractive uh, for investments uh, for entrepreneurs for business building 
uh, and I think uh, James reflected a bit on Kenya with uh, a number of initiatives and so forth to support during the COVID. If anything, we have been uh, you know impressed, uh, and we have many things on ongoing in Kenya. I would have to say that we have not been as impressed with my friends in Ethiopia, uh, my uh, country of birth, where my heart is, uh, but on many dimensions, it has not been supportive uh, for international business activity during COVID-19, made it very difficult to restructure and, and stay alive. Uh, so, uh, so I would also just, to be a little bit provocative, say that you know this has also reflected a bit on uh, on uh, the attractiveness of uh, being active in different countries across the the continent. Yeah, the, the pandemic has exposed a lot of shortcomings, and not just uh, in Africa. You know, James, please, you wanted to. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to add to something Trondo was saying. You know, even for traditional companies, I think there's a lot of opportunities for tech to step in in terms of, because you're sort of trying to clean out the inefficiencies in your in your value chain. So whether it's in your supply chain, you know, B2B tech solutions that are addressing supply chain issues, route to market issues, payment issues, uh, because even, even digital marketing issues, because the traditional large budgets that we've had, the way you've sort of reached the, created awareness with the market, people are shifting away from TV and billboards to more digital solutions. So there's a lot of room for, there's a huge market for tech solutions and even locally based innovations targeted towards a B2B segment, which is able and willing to pay for that service and which is probably going to be cheaper for them than what they were doing uh, traditionally. And also people are looking at their balance sheets, looking for more capital light uh, balance sheets. So tech solutions that enable you to share infrastructure, uh, et cetera. Uh, those are going to be critical. Anything that can take out a necessary infrastructure, a necessary fixed cost from your system. Uh, a lot of CFOs are now more open to that conversation. Uh, take out some of your embedded uh, cost of software, licenses, etc. So it's going to be very disruptive and that creates a huge opportunity for, for nimble players. Uh, I, we have seven minutes left, uh, I'm told. Um, and I want to spend those last seven minutes uh, zooming out a little bit here and, and trying to address... Uh, you know the, the the real big picture question around this. We've we've spent a, a fair bit of time on the practical and some of the detail <laughs> here. But you know what's clear is that you know this this pandemic has sort of drawn a line in between you know where we were heading, um, and it's now kind of up for debate uh, where we go next. And and what's what uh, you know quite a few politicians certainly and some companies are trying to push is the idea that this is an opportunity for a reset. That not, you know, yes, there's been some downside, yes, there's negative impacts, but there's also this wonderful upside because now we can completely reinvent the way we do business. We can prioritize investment in sustainable energy, green energy. We can, you know, we can refocus on, um, on you know, human capital development, et cetera, et cetera. Sounds great. Sounds nice. Sounds way too nice to be realistic, if you ask me. Because, um, you know, maybe if you're some multinational and you've got, uh, and you're sitting on billions of dollars in cash. But if you are most businesses right now, the only thing you're thinking about is survival. You're not thinking about wishy-washy ambitions of you know coming back stronger, better, more resilient. Where do you guys stand on this? Like, is this an opportunity for a reset? And what, what, what does a reset look like? What, what does that mean? Uh, who would like to go first? I, I think I can go. I think... Uh, James. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, to Trent, please, please go, Trent. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, no, you, 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 you got there first, so go for it. Yeah, you know, I think every business has had a chance to, to, to introspect. The, the environment has, has changed. And um, I think we'll all have to change in one way or another. We're all going to look at our core structures. There's been, you know, in years where growth has been great, margins have been high, a lot of inefficiencies inevitably creeps into the, into the P&L. And, and, and to sort of everyone is having serious examinations of that, rethinking uh, how we do processes, things that we did not think possible, sort of we are, we are, we are looking at it. So the whole, the, the whole sort of process of how value is delivered to the consumer, and both from a process, from a balance sheet, from a funding point of view, I think a lot of uh, businesses, at least across our portfolio, is something that you're doing. And those who don't do, then you'll find yourself facing more nimble competitors 
and probably more efficient uh, competitors. So I think it's it's something that is critical for any business to do post uh, this particular situation that we're in. So would you say, in, in a way, uh, the pandemic has been a, a necessary, if very unpleasant, market correction here a little bit? It's yeah, sort of like a forest fire. Then, you know, <laughs> then everything has to grow fresh. <laughs> right, yeah, it's one of those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. not nice, but you know, it's no, one no, of those it's, things it's, that happens, right? Yeah, it it does was, happen. Yeah. yeah, it is reality. It does happen. Uh, Trunt, over to you. Do you see an opportunity for a reset? I think James's point is kind of, is a good one, which is there is a reset whether you like it or not. What that looks like is is what we need to figure out. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think that's well well put. And um, I think, as I said in the beginning, um, I've been impressed with. Uh, uh, the entrepreneurs uh, in Africa in terms of their willingness to adjust and reset to this new situ situation. And I've seen them do that quicker and with more energy and more optimism than I often find here in in Europe. So, so um, and, and across the, the 10 companies where we are involved, none of them are even dreaming about going back to normal. Every one of them are doing new things uh, and new opportunities. And I just uh, thought about this with Opera Software, for example. We always had a problem getting to partner up with the telcos to have integrated data plans and so forth. Very hard to get that moving on the continent. What I hear from Opera now is in a new situation, it's much easier to get new partnerships. Uh, so everyone is rethinking their business models. So that's a new set of opportunities uh, for, for uh, everyone, I believe. Take another interesting example. We, are create, we have a data platform for traceability of, uh, of, uh, of produce in the food industry, so um, uh, called FarmForce. And uh, now in the COVID-19, uh, consumers uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe are demanding traceability. I want to know this chocolate, the cacao farmers on the Ivory Coast, where does it come from, is it quality, and so forth. So the willingness to pay on the producer side for traceability is much higher. Cargill and all of these guys are getting in. And that again creates monetary means to actually support the farmers. So, so uh, certainly you get some of that positive as aspects coming back to the continent too. And uh, so, so to your question, I think uh, they're all gonna reset. And uh, I think to a, to a large degree for the better and for more, more opportunity. Great, James, opportunity for final comment before I wrap up if you want it. Yeah, I think I can take it. I think, uh, as Trump says, it's what it is. So you, I think we, we've all accepted the situation as it is. You sort of try and adjust and, um, and, 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 and serve the customer and, and also believe that the opportunity is for growth. You know, it's not just a defensive play. You're also looking at what, what, what opportunities are there in the market. They are, the competitive landscape has also changed. A number of competitors are probably out of the field. And um, sort of it's all of us trying to position ourselves to be in a better position in the competitive landscape uh, post, uh, post, post all this. Uh, you know, sort of operating from, from Kenya and East Africa in particular, I continue to see a lot of uh, wonderful opportunities here. And so I'd like to encourage all of you to, you know, to, to consider doing business here and also to consider uh, engaging with local partners. So... Uh, because then situations like this find you with a local partner who is then on the ground and who you can continue sort of en en engaging with. So yes, so I'm, 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 yeah, despite the challenges, I, I remain very positive and we are seeing a good recovery. Uh, look, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. We have to wrap up, but uh, I, I think that's been uh, very, very helpful, very useful. Great to get uh, first-hand accounts of what's going on. And uh, I found it slightly encouraging, you know, uh, it's not over. Uh, there is hope. Um, I think all, all of us have had, all of us had have felt the anxiety of this year. It's been um, if you just follow the news, it's been pretty scary. But I think the the two big takeaways here are um, there are still opportunities, and especially digital and tech right now is what you should be looking at uh, because that's where, for obvious reasons, the growth will be. I think the second big takeaway is that change is here and it's here to stay. Um, don't kid yourself that you're going to be able to get through this without having to make some major adjustments. Exactly what that looks like is something that I think people are going to continue to figure out as we go along, because right now uh, everyone is sort of uh, scratching their heads 
most of all, it seems, the politicians who are supposed to be uh, looking out for all of us. But that is a conversation for another day. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Thank you very much to everyone uh, in the chat. Thank you to Naba for putting on such a great discussion. And uh, enjoy the next coffee break. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.